I'm Ryan Szymanski, Curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, we're going to talk about identifying different types of ships, uh, specifically during the World War II period. I'm presenting to you live from my library. So, ship spotting is something that was done by both civilians and military personnel during World War II. Although electronic uh, detection measures were brand new and starting to come out, uh, visual detection was still the best way to determine what you are seeing. Uh, so on ships, your lookouts and various bridge personnel would have recognition booklets that they could use to identify ships and aircraft that they were seeing. Uh, you also had civilian spotters, uh, whether they be coast watchers in the Pacific Islands or uh, regular civilians back home who might be helping with uh, spotting of incoming ships and airplanes just to get a little bit of identification whether they are friendly or not on their way in. So let's start with aircraft carriers. They're the most recently evolved of the various types of warships we'll talk about today uh, and they should be the most readily distinguishable. Their defining characteristic is the long flat deck. In fact, aircraft carriers have the nickname flat tops. This is their runway for launching aircraft off the bow and recovering them from the stern. Their hull is relatively tall and blocky because in addition to the living spaces, which you can see in this dark blue band, which is common to all of the ships we'll see today, they also have a hangar space, which is the lighter gray band on top. And that is where all of the aircraft are maintained and refueled, rearmed in between flights. A series of elevators on the main deck will bring the aircraft up to deck uh, where they can be launched. Steam catapults on the bow can assist in launching, although most World War II propeller planes uh, could generate enough lift if the carrier was just turned into the wind and going at high speed where they could take off with their own power. And it's got a series of cables along the aft end of the ship, which an arrestor hook on the tail fin of the aircraft could catch on landing to keep it from crashing into aircraft on the forward end of the flight deck. Now, unlike other ships we'll look at, aircraft carriers don't have a particularly large superstructure. Uh, they don't really need it. They've got some command and control functions here, some electronics and fire control equipment for their few guns, uh, but otherwise, they need to leave their deck flat and open for their aircraft. As far as guns go, they've got batteries of anti-aircraft guns along the sides, but they don't have much in the way of offensive weaponry uh, or things that can damage ships. Their main weapon is their aircraft. So this model I have right here is uh, the American Carrier number 11, Intrepid, which is a museum ship in New York, currently closed. Uh, and uh, this sort of carrier could carry close to 100 aircraft, usually about five 18-plane squadrons. These squadrons will often be two fighter plane squadrons, one to keep as combat air patrol and one to launch with your strike group to protect against the enemy's combat air patrol. Uh, they would usually have a torpedo bomber squadron, which could do any submarine warfare, uh, torpedo large capital ships, or level bomb surface targets. Uh, and they'd usually have two squadrons of dive bombers, which would be used as scouts uh, and to dive bomb either surface ships or surface targets ashore to support landing operations. Aircraft carriers have very little armor and very high speed. So let's compare the American Essex-class aircraft carrier, like Intrepid here, to a Japanese carrier. Uh, in this case, Shokaku is a very similar design that predates the Essexes by a couple of years. Uh, those ships have an even smaller island superstructure as early Japanese carriers vented the smoke out through a trunk in the hull as opposed to having a smokestack like American carriers. So that allowed them to remove half of their superstructure. They also didn't have cross-deck firing guns like the American ships. They were all in sponsons on the side of the hull. Uh, the Japanese carriers were also designed for extreme high speed. Uh, carriers fall under the category of speed equals armor. If you cannot find me, you cannot hurt me. So uh, the easiest way to 
remain undetected is to be able to sail at greater than 30 knots away from where you last were. So if you get spotted by an enemy aircraft, uh, by the time they're able to report back and a strike is able to launch from 400 miles away, two hours have elapsed and you could be 60 miles in any direction. Uh, so your Japanese carriers are going to be a little bit narrower uh, for higher speed. So the dominant naval vessel before the aircraft carrier was the battleship. As you can see from these two 1700 scale models, battleships are roughly the same size as carriers. Although battleships tend to be narrower because they don't support a large flight deck. For their offensive weaponry, battleships are using their main guns. In this case, for New Jersey, we've got nine 16 inch guns in three three gun turrets. These guns can fire about 23 miles, uh, which is extremely good for a naval gun, but hundreds of miles short of what an aircraft can do. Uh, battleships are most distinguished from smaller surface warships by their tall superstructure. This is also a factor of their gunnery, whereas smaller cruisers we'll see later on have shorter range guns, they don't need to see where their shells are falling at extreme far ranges. Battleships do need to spot the fall of their shot over the horizon, so they have tall superstructures. In our case, the main battery fire control is 12 stories above the main deck of the ship, and that allows it to see a little bit over the horizon so you can see almost to the maximum range of your guns. Uh, it doesn't quite get you there as these guns were very high caliber, so battleships would often carry on their fantails uh, spotter aircraft that they could launch from a catapult and then recover these uh, aircraft for float points that would land in the water. They could recover them with a crane, uh, but these would orbit over an enemy fleet, maybe on the other side of the horizon where we can't see, and report back uh, where the guns are firing. Uh, battleships also feature large batteries of anti-aircraft guns. In this model, which is New Jersey in the 1980s, you can see some of the 5-inch guns, which were our dual-purpose secondary battery, uh, and you might be able to see some of the Sponsons where earlier anti-aircraft guns were stored. Battleships are characterized by comparatively slow speed, but extremely heavy armor and heavy guns. A comparable Japanese battleship built around the same time frame would be Yamato. Uh, Yamato was a little bit shorter and significantly wider because she had almost one-third more displacement. Whereas New Jersey was designed for high speed, uh, Yamato was six knots slower, but significantly more heavily armored uh, because she also had heavier guns. Whereas New Jersey has nine 16-inch guns, Yamato had nine 18.1-inch guns, the largest naval guns ever put on a warship. Uh, the trend with battleships is if you're building a ship with 16-inch guns, you want to armor it against an enemy uh, with the same size guns, because they're probably building something the same size. So in Yamato's case, she had the heaviest guns, she also had the heaviest armor plating. Our next type of ship is the cruiser. Cruisers were the longtime scouts of the battle force with their high speed. Uh, they have relatively light armor, and their guns are usually only about half the size of a battleship's guns. In this case, I've got a model of USS Indianapolis. She's armed with nine 18 inch guns, or excuse me, eight inch guns. Outwardly, she looks very similar to the battleship, but when you compare it to New Jersey, she's only about two thirds of the length. Uh, and her superstructure is much shorter. Her guns aren't being fired as far. Another key feature to notice with this ship, uh, because of its scouting role, is it's got radar antenna built on top of a high mast. The higher you can get that radar antenna, the greater your range. This ship is also extremely narrow, so it can get high speed. Uh, and a typical cruiser in the World War II period was designed to be about 10,000 ton standard displacement, and some of the larger ones got up to 15 or 20,000 tons. 
You'll also notice that this ship is bristling with anti-aircraft guns. In a carrier task force, these ships would form the close-in defense for the carriers or battleships and uh, use their anti-aircraft guns to protect carriers against any aircraft that make it through the combat air patrol. A comparable Japanese heavy cruiser would be Takeo. Uh, she was built around the same time frame as Indianapolis, uh, whereas the American ship has three triple turrets, Takeo had five twin turrets, so she ended up with one more uh, barrel. This meant that if one of her turrets is knocked out, less of her main battery is knocked out in total. Uh, these ships are nicknamed tinclads. It doesn't take much to sink them. Most of the uh, cruisers that were sunk during the war took 20 to 30 shots uh, before they were hit, or one to two torpedoes that would put them out of action. This is an American light cruiser, USS Cleveland, uh, which the naval treaties in the interwar period listed light cruisers as being approximately the same size as heavy cruisers, except heavy cruisers are armed with 8-inch guns, light cruisers have more numerous 6-inch guns. There was some question in the interwar period whether it was better to hit with a single large projectile or be able to hit with multiple light projectiles. So these ships end up being similar armor, similar size, uh, but different gun sizes. So now we're talking about destroyers. This destroyer sized model, as you can see, is about one third the size of an IO class battleship. So it's about half the size of a cruiser in terms of length. In terms of weight, it's significantly lighter, with the average destroyer of the World War II period probably being about 2,000 tons although they ran the gamut from a little over a thousand tons to uh, just under three thousand tons. So, destroyers tended to have a main battery of five inch guns that were dual purpose, so for most nations they could engage aircraft or surface ships, although they weren't particularly effective against most surface ships. Uh, against a battleship, a destroyer's main armament is going to be its torpedo tubes, usually located amidships. Another key feature of destroyers is their anti-submarine weapons, usually on the fantail. Uh, this usually takes the form of depth charge racks or throwers. These could launch uh, depth charges that could sink submarines. Underwater, these ships would have both passive and active sonar to be able to detect submarines. So, uh, Larger ships like cruisers, aircraft carriers, and battleships did not have this capability built in. The tin cans here could be mass-produced and uh, would form the outer protective ring of a task group. In a future video, we're going to show you some different types of naval formations, and uh, you'll get to see how uh, destroyers formed an outer ring with cruisers forming an inner ring, and then battleships and aircraft carriers, the capital ships, well protected on the inside. All right, so our last uh, type of warship we're going to discuss is the submarine. Well, this is a modern uh, Seawolf submarine. You'll have to forgive me, I don't have many model subs. Uh, they're boring models to build. Sorry, sub club. Uh, they, there just isn't much to them besides the superstructure and a deck gun or two. So they tend to be about the same size as destroyers, which is to say significantly smaller than battleships or carriers. Their main armor uh, is their stealth, so they do not have any real defense. You put a hole on a submarine and it doesn't work very good anymore. Their, their whole defense is to stay undetected underwater. Modern submarines can do that full time. Uh, World War II submarines more, were more like submersibles. They could stay underwater during the day when they were likely to be seen, but at night uh, they had to come back to the surface, charge their batteries, get more air on board, uh, and look for more targets. Their main weapon was the torpedo. Torpedoes could defeat the armor of even the most heavily armed battleships, uh, so this was a great equalizer where you could build a lot of really light, cheap submarines. Uh, again, they're about the same size as destroyers during World War II, so you can build a lot of them and deploy them, uh, and if you can get them within range of an enemy ship, 
avoiding an enemy fleet's destroyer escorts, uh, you can really neutralize some of their heavier targets. So, our activity for the day is going to be ship spotting. For the purposes of our activity, assume that you are a lookout on the battleship New Jersey. It's World War II, and we're going to throw up a picture here of a ship that you might see as a lookout on the battleship New Jersey. I need you to tell me whether it's one we would shoot at or not. So, would we shoot at this ship? This is an American Baltimore-class heavy cruiser, another common sort of ship which would be in the escort for battleships and aircraft carriers. This one uh, was a very effective anti-aircraft defensive screen and would often operate close to the battleship New Jersey. We would not want to shoot at it. However, if a battleship like us did shoot at them, their armor is only designed to protect them against cruiser-sized guns. So the heavy caliber guns of our battleship would be able to shoot them to pieces. Off Guadalcanal in 1942, American cruisers engaged uh, Japanese battleships, uh, and while at point-blank range they were able to inflict some damage with their 6- and 8-inch guns, uh, many of those ships were disabled. All right, guys, do we want to shoot at this ship? This tin can is an American Fletcher-class destroyer. You would have commonly seen these ships around Battleship New Jersey escorting uh, and protecting us against submarines. We would not want to shoot at them because they're our own ship. If we did shoot at one of these ships, however, nicknamed a tin can, uh, it wouldn't hold up to our guns very well. There was one famous instance off Samar in 1944 where American destroyers ended up by accident getting engaged by Japanese battleships. They were able to use their torpedoes to drive the battleships away. However, their armor didn't stop Japanese shells at all, so many of the American destroyers engaged there were heavily damaged or sunk. So, is this a ship that we would want to shoot at? This is a Japanese submarine, typical of their fleet during World War II. Submarines like this did great damage to American battleships and carriers uh, and some of our cruisers when they were able to get through our uh, destroyer defensive screen to get at the capital units. It's absolutely something Battleship New Jersey would want to shoot at if we caught them on the surface. No good submarine commander is going to allow their boat to be caught on the surface by a battleship, however, and New Jersey has no defenses against a submerged submarine. So while this is an enemy ship we would want to shoot at, it is not one that we would be capable of shooting at. All right, so what ship is this, everyone? It is the Japanese aircraft carrier Shokaku. That is absolutely a type of ship we would want to shoot at. However, American battleships never got the chance to fire on aircraft carriers because, remember, their striking range was about 400 miles compared to the range of our guns, 23 miles, and uh, Shokaku was designed to be even faster than Battleship New Jersey, so we couldn't even run a ship like that down. Japanese aircraft carriers like Shokaku managed to cause significant damage to American battleships, especially at Pearl Harbor. So, uh, where Shokaku did fight. So, uh, this is a sort of ship we would want to shoot if we could get close enough to do it. Thanks for watching today, guys. Make sure you check the description down below. That has a link to uh, an activity like this you can do at home. If you're a teacher and you want to do it in your classroom, or if you just want to do it with your family, that's down below in the description. There are also links to our ship store. While we're closed right now, we're losing about $10,000 a day. So anything you could do to support us, like buying things from our ship store, would greatly help. Our ship store does carry ship spotting cards, so be sure to check those out. Uh, also, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and check our various social media platforms every day. Uh, and this is Ryan and the Trooper signing off. See you guys tomorrow.